coffee in and grab their seats. Wow, that, was, that worked really well. Uh, I'm Ellen Hannock. I'm the director of the PPIC Water Policy Center. I'm going to just start by welcoming everybody today. Um, we, we love doing these programs, but the only, unless people want to come to them, they, there's no point in doing them. So, so you are a, a big part of the success of what's going to happen today. Um, also want to welcome folks that are, are signed up for the webcast. Um, and let's see, I have a couple sort of little things to, to kick off before we start the program. Uh, first, just I think a lot of you probably are, are repeat um, attendees of PPIC events, but for those of you who don't know PPIC, we are a nonpartisan, policy-oriented research organization with offices in, in San Francisco and Sacramento. And the Water Policy Center at PPIC, which I direct, is basically in, in the business of looking for creative solutions and approaches to tackling some of California's toughest water challenges and in ways that are good for the economy, for the environment, and for society. And we do this in collaboration with a lot of folks around the state, including researchers from many different organizations and with policymakers and stakeholders from around the state. And so the, the, this program today, it's our second annual water policy conference that kind of is designed to kick off the, the new water year, which started on October 1st. It's a, it's a good time to be thinking about looking back on the year that was and looking forward to, to the year ahead um, where folks are gonna be uh, active both on, on the legislative side and in implementing policy um, at all levels, state, local, and, and federal. So this, this conference is, is really a, a chance to kind of take stock and, and, and look ahead. And we um, are really, really grateful to a couple dozen of our annual sponsors for, for supporting this event and also for supporting uh, the work that we, we put into a, a short document that you've got um, at your seats, Priorities for California's Water. The sponsors are, are both listed back here, but then also up on the screen. Um, this is kind of your, your cheat sheet for, for the year of, uh, and, and really synthesizes. It was developed by, by the, the, the Water Policy Center team and by our communications group at PPIC, but really kind of synthesizes a lot of the, the work that we've been doing with our, our research partners um, over the last few years on, on some of the tough challenges and, and hopefully some, some of the priorities and, and innovative solutions that, that we can tackle going forward. So before we kick off the, the really great panel discussions that we're gonna have, I'm gonna give you a, a little bit of an overview of, of that. Then we're gonna roll into three great panel discussions. There's gonna be time for Q&A uh, at, the, at the end of each of those. And then at the, a, after the third panel discussion, we're gonna break into informal lunch. So we hope you'll stay for that. That's just a chance to kind of continue the conversations at your table, or you can kind of do a movable feast and switch around and go to a different table. Um, so I think housekeeping. So I have folk, my, 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 my uh, handlers are, are really good at making sure that I don't forget to, to tell the important things. Um, the report and the slides that I'm gonna um, present are, are available online for anybody who wants them. This is being videoed, so the videos for the, the, the whole uh, morning are gonna be up on our website within a couple few days, so you can catch up on anything that you missed or send it off to, to other folks who you think might be interested. Um, to make this work really well, it's good if cell phones are not ringing, so please silence them or, or turn them off. And then uh, later today, you're gonna receive a short, uh, you're gonna receive an email requesting you to take a short survey just about what you thought about the event and a chance to, for you to give us some feedback on what we can do better. That's really helpful to us, so, so please, please do take a couple minutes to, to fill that out. Um, let's see, just other logistics, restrooms, upstairs in this direction. Um, and okay, here we go. So now a, a little overview of the cheat sheet on priorities for California's water for, for the, the coming year. So 
I guess, you know, one of the things that's really been striking about the weather that California has been experiencing over the last six years is that it's really highlighted the variability, the extreme variability of the, the climate in this state. And we Western climate in general, Western states climate in general is more variable than, than cl the climate on the East Coast, but California is off the charts in that regard. And we really saw this in, uh, in its full glory over, over the, the years since 2012. We, we had a, a five-year drought that included record high temperatures, and the longest uh, four-year period, of, uh, the driest four-year period on record, um, some la lasting impacts to that, including a lot of groundwater pumping and lowering of groundwater levels, as well as, as stressed ecosystems. And we also then ended this drought with uh, what we thought when we went to print was, gonna, was record precipitation. It was record precipitation in Northern California. Statewide, it was number two um, in, in terms of wettest years on record. Um, this added stress to dams and levees. You know, prime example of that was the the Oroville Dam uh, incident early in the winter. It also added a lot of fuel to fire prone landscapes. Before, when we went to print, we didn't know uh, that it, it, it turned out to be a record fire year. You know, just with devastating fires in many parts of the state. Um, and so. You know, thinking about this going forward, um, we know that th this is likely to be uh, kind of a, a sign of what we should be expecting actually even more of in, in the future, of you know, more, more, more high rising temperatures and even more variability is what the models are, are predicting. So what we look at in this short piece is we try to provide a little bit of a roadmap of some priorities in areas that, that we identify as really key where actions are, are going to be important to undertake to, to get us on a, on a path to more sustainable uh, water, water management for the economy and the environment and society. So the first kind of group of, of issues is ensuring clean and reliable water supplies. And this is about getting better at storing water, both to manage floods but also to manage droughts, um, getting better at managing demand, which is going to be key both to get through droughts and also to help us store water uh, for, for the dry times. And then a really key issue, which is safe drinking water in, in communities that do not have access to this right now on a regular basis, which is just a, a really big issue in, in parts of rural California. Second group of, of big issues is enhancing the environment. And we're focusing here on, on a couple of things. One is the health of our headwater forests. We had a, a study that just came out about this, uh, looking at this a, a few weeks ago. And then the other is looking at our freshwater ecosystems, which both of these ecosystems were really hit hard by, by the prolonged drought. And it's kind of aggravated some, some conditions that were already there and really increased the call for urgency to, to, to take new steps. And then the third is tackling problems in two key watersheds that are really important for California's water supply, the Colorado River system and the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. In both of these watersheds, big decisions are on the table in terms of how we go forward with managing both for supply and for the environment. So I'm going to just give you a, a little bit of an overview of each of these and the panel discussions are going to, going to go into more depth on a lot of them. So first, ensuring clean and reliable supplies, we, we start with storage, water storage, and just acknowledging that the changing climate is going to be affecting snowpack, floods, and droughts, and really making us, forcing us to rethink our, our storage system, which right now includes some free snowpack that we, that we get every year, and that kind of melts up, has been melting at the right time to provide irrigation water. That snowpack is shrinking as the temperatures are increasing. Um, we have to manage, manage storage better for flood purposes, and we have to also manage storage better for, for droughts. Um, our, Reservoirs and our, our dams were designed with the historical climate in mind, and so looking ahead, we're going to have to be thinking about how we how we repurpose them and how we how how we use them better for the the more variable climate of the future that has less snowpack. Um, our systems also are inadequate for recharging aquifers as much as we're going to need to be doing. There's already a lot of activity uh, in re recharging aquifers in various parts of the state, but there's more that can be done. And this year actually provided a really good test 
of what's working and what's not, and folks are starting to kind of reap the lessons of that. So the priorities that we outline, there are several. Um, we really, you know, the basic idea is we need more forward-looking storage management. One of them is really thinking about how to manage surface water and groundwater together so that you can kind of uh, get the, get, maximi maximize the amount that you can store by, by using them as a system more than we do now. Um, the second one is removing barriers to groundwater recharge, and those include infrastructure barriers like, you know, conveyance to get the water to places where you can recharge. It also includes various kinds of institutional and regulatory barriers that just because our systems have not been set up think, thinking about how we maximize groundwater recharge, and so we've got to think about how to retool some of those rules and, and, and permitting procedures. And then the third is modernizing our dams to adapt to a changing climate. And this is definitely on the radar now. I think that the, you know, one of the, the bright lights from the Oroville crisis was that it really put a spotlight on, on ways in which we need to improve there. So the second area that we focus on here is managing demand. And this is really important in order to have more reliable supplies for dry times. And when we think about managing demand, you know, during the drought we saved a lot of water, both in the urban areas and in the, in the agricultural um, areas. Um, and I think you know, now both in both of those sectors, folks are really looking ahead to how can they kind of continue to improve efficiency and, and, and maximize the, 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 the gains and continue that momentum. One of the things that we, we, we found in a study, a recent study of urban and suburban response to the drought was that it's going to be really important to think about managing uh, the, balancing the short-term conservation and long-term efficiency. And what I mean by that is when you're doing a lot of short-term storage, that's, uh, sorry, short-term savings, that's a way of kind of getting through a drought and belt tightening. If you're saving a lot of water over the long term, that gives you a little bit less belt tightening ability in the, in the short term. So what we propose there is that you have to think about that together and make sure that you're saving some of that water that you're saving over the long term, that you're, that you're not using over the long term, and getting that into storage so you have it for dry times. The second in the agricultural sector is, you know, especially in areas that are going to have to be managing groundwater more tightly and reducing groundwater overdraft, um, it's going to be basin scale approaches, not just what farmers are doing on their individual farms. And there's going to be a need to get better accounting for how much water is being used, how much water is being saved, and making sure that folks are getting credit for that so that they have the right incentives. The third area that we highlight is making it easier to trade water. Uh, this is really important during droughts as well as over the long term, and it's not as easy as it should be in California. Third area in the supply, managing supplies, is safe drinking water. And I, I know we're going to be talking about this in the first panel. Uh, we have a number of systems, small systems and, and domestic wells in rural areas of California that do not have safe water, that have you know, chemical contaminants in their water. Um, there were also a number of places that went dry uh, because of, of groundwater levels falling during the drought. So there are a number of ways in which we recommend improving those conditions and, and, and addressing this. And this is a solvable problem. We just need to roll up our sleeves and, and do it. Third, the second area that we highlight is enhancing the natural environment. And I mentioned that we talk about both headwaters and freshwater ecosystems. So first, headwater forests. This is a, a good snapshot for anybody who's not been up in the Sierra over the last few years. This is what you're seeing more and more, a lot of dead trees that were that died because of the drought conditions that really created, created optimal conditions for beetles to attack the trees. So you know, the estimates are about 100 million dead trees across California. Um, this is a, the drought exacerbated a long-term problem of trees, uh, forests getting overly dense with a lot more small trees and, and fewer large ones. And you know, a lot of fire risks uh, related to, to these conditions and forest benefits of all kinds, including water supply, water quality, ecosystem, and, and recreational benefits at risk because of this. So the recommendations that the team came up with in the, in, in the recent study include uh, the things listed here, making forest health a, a top priority for management. So not just having fire suppression be the main thing that we're worried about when we're managing the forest, but forest health, that means expanding the pace and scale of 
what are called treatments in, in the world of forest management. So that's managed fire and mechanical thinning, improving accounting of at-risk forests and the kinds of treatments that are used. We don't always have a good sense of what's happening um, to measure that well. And then looking for opportunities to offset costs by, by getting some revenues from the harvesting and managing, managing treatments in a way that kind of bundled, bundles harvest with other things. And using new collaborative tools, there are a number of promising new tools available for federal and state and local partners to work together, and we think there's a lot of promise there. For ecosystems in, in, that, that depend on fresh water, you know, so this is rivers, wetlands, um, streams, there was a lot of, lot of uh, damage during the drought just because of the dry, hot conditions. And what we're suggesting is we really need to think of a new approach. And actually, there's going to be a report coming out in a few weeks that this sort of tees up a little bit some of those, some of the recommendations you're going to see fleshed out more fully there. Promote projects that benefit both people and nature. Um, the second panel is going to talk about this in, in depth, I think. Develop plans that are at the watershed scale to build ecosystem health. Adopt ecosystem water budgets, so a, a sort of set, an amount that folks know about um, that the, that's available for the ecosystem. And create more reliable funding sources. And then finally, the, the last couple of issues are pro tackling problems in key watersheds. Uh, we have big decisions coming up both in the Colorado River and in the Delta Basin. Uh, in the Colorado, over allocation of this river over the long term um, has, is a challenge. And the states are having to figure out, how, along with Mexico, how to, how, to, how to ramp down use and manage demand in a way that, that makes this work for, for all of the places that depend on it including, you know, it's a major source for Southern California. The reliability of the Delta water supply is at risk from climate change, from levee failures, and both of these watersheds have big environmental issues uh, that, and, and, and problems that, that need to be tackled as well. So in the Colorado, collaboration is key, and there's been a lot of progress over the last decade among the states and with Mexico in this regard, but more needs to be done. Um, California needs to continue to work with the other states for, to foster flexible solutions and to avoid mandatory cuts. Uh, we are kind of in a better position than a lot of the other states in terms of our seniority on this river, but if we're not good team players, um, that will not bode well for us a, as a state. Support implementation of a, a new agreement with Mexico. This is a really good piece of, of news in September. A new, a new agreement was signed with Mexico for sharing and cooperative approaches with the, with the, the, the U.S. states. And then building momentum for addressing the environmental and public health issues in the Salton Sea, which is you know, a, a, a really big and looming issue. And then the Delta, which has been in the news a lot lately, and we'll talk about both of these watersheds in the last panel. Complex, enduring water challenge, it's decision time on tunnels, um, and whether that's going to be the future of uh, water supply management um, in, 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 for the Delta. And with or without the tunnels, decisions are also going to be needed on how to better manage the ecosystem, and how to better manage flood, flood protection in that region. So we have some suggestions about that, and I think the panel will probably talk about that as well. So that is the end of the sort of overview. Um, and now I'm going to invite Katrin Chappelle, here is she, Associate Director of, of the Water Center and um, a, a wonderful colleague up. She's going to be moderating this next panel and the um, three panelists, please come on up and I'll let Katrin introduce them. Thank you.